Hello and welcome everyone to the latest episode of PHMC's Virtual Collections Showcase. My name is Joshua Roth and I am the site administrator at the Pennsylvania Lumber Museum in Potter County. And it is my pleasure to host this event this evening. Uh, we've got with us five different panelists from uh, various museums in the Pennsylvania Historical Museum Commission's museum system. Uh, and each of them will be presenting an object from their collections that fits the theme of tonight's episode, which is most rare, unique, or endangered item. Uh, we talked a little bit before we let everyone into the uh, uh, meeting, and uh, we're going to keep it completely random. So I am just going to select folks uh, as they appear in order on my uh, little Brady Bunch box screen here for Zoom. And as I select, each of those folks will have uh, five minutes to present their case. They will be able to share their screen and uh, tell you all about their objects. Uh, the winner at the end of the evening, after you all vote as to which object you think best embodies that theme of rare, endangered, or unique item, uh, will get to host a future episode of this program, uh, bragging rights among their uh, colleagues within the system. And with uh, much anticipation, I present to you the return of the PHMC championship belt. This was the original championship belt that was made for the first episode of Virtual Collections Showcase uh, by me with my children's uh, sparkly markers and glitter. So uh, <laughs> we haven't been able to get together and be able to present the belt to winner in person. So that will have to be a virtual presentation as well, but uh, always fun. So I thought I would uh, share that with the group. So uh, hopefully everyone's familiar with how this works at this point. Again, if you have a question, please type it into the chat. And the first person on uh, my screen in terms of presenters is uh, Jennifer Eaton from the Pennsylvania Military Museum. So we will let her present her most rare, unique or endangered object from the Military Museum's collection and then uh, move on from there. So take it away, Jennifer. All right, thank you. Let me share my screen here. So tonight I'm going to be talking about the model 1917 light tank. Here you can see a picture of it in our gallery with its very unique paint scheme. When World War I broke out, and the United States joined the war in 1917, we did not own any tanks. Um, and after, after some study, General Patton decided that tanks were a battlefield necessity with the uh, increased technology and trench warfare that became uh, an integral part of World War I. Um, so when we went overseas, the US borrowed a few French and British tanks to get through the end of the war but they began development on their own tank that was modeled after the French Renault FT-17 tank. Um, during its uh, development, the, the tank was known as the six ton special tractor. Um, we originally contracted for an order of 4,440 tanks. Uh, of that number, 950 tanks were produced. They were made by three different companies the Van Dorn Ironworks, Maxwell Motor Company, and the CL Best Company. The tanks were used as infantry support vehicles. Um, they typically followed behind troops to take out positions that infantry couldn't. Um, they were very successful at blasting over trenches and ditches. However, only 10 of our American tanks made it to Europe before the end of the war, and none of those tanks saw combat. Um, the tanks were used during the war and after the war as promotions to sell Liberty War Bonds. Um, they were also used in China in 1927 during the Nanking Uprising, and unfortunately to also put down the 1932 Bonus Army Revolt in Washington, D.C. Um, specifications for the tank, um, it had a Buddha modified four-cylinder engine with a whopping 42 horsepower. Um, it was armed with a 37 millimeter cannon or a Marlin Rockwell 1917 machine gun. 
and later modified for Browning M19 machine gun. The thickness of the armor on the tank varied depending on the location between a quarter of an inch and a little over half an inch. It was 16 and a half feet long, could go a blistering five and a half miles per hour and was manned by a crew of two. And you can see in the diagram how tight uh, the, the quarters were inside the tank. Uh, the driver of the tank sat on a small canvas seat uh, with the gunner standing behind him. And uh, I've been inside our tank and you had to be a pretty small person to even uh, get inside it. Whoops, going too fast. Our tank came to the museum from a man named Jane William Ritchie in the late 1960s. Ritchie was from Everett, PA. He was a World War I veteran and served as an ordnance sergeant overseas for a little over 20 months. Um, it's likely that he probably had experience with tanks during his service. Uh, I don't know that for certain, but um, he certainly so showed some interest in them after the war. He purchased the tank from Frankfurt Arsenal at an auction in uh, 1932. The tank had been used for tours around the arsenal outside Philadelphia. Um, when Ritchie purchased the tank, it had no engine anymore. An officer at the arsenal had removed the engine from the tank and used it in his boat. So <laughs> Ritchie replaced it with a, a Ford Model A engine and drove the tank in parades. Um, during World War II, friends of Ritchie's uh, hid the tank under a haystack in a barn to save it from being commandeered for, during scrap drives. Um, after World War II, uh, Ritchie again drove the tank in parades uh, till the early 1960s when he struck a parked car and decided that maybe his time as a tank driver was coming to an end and he offered the tank to the museum. Um, the tank was restored in 2006 to the color scheme that you see now, which is likely what the tank originally looked like. Um, that seems like a strange color pattern for camouflage, but uh, the disruptive pattern camo used during World War I wasn't really intended to hide the tank or other equipment that was painted with that scheme. It was more to obscure the shape to allow it not to be such an easy target for artillery. Um, what makes the tank unique? There are only 20 known M1917 light tanks left in the world. Many of the tanks were sold for scrap um, and 250 or so were sent to Canada to use for training. Um, our tank is the only remaining M1917 tank left in the world fitted for the original Marlin machine gun. Um, we are fortunate enough at the museum to also have in our collection one of two surviving M1917 Marlin tank machine guns. The only other known model of the tank machine gun is located at the Martin Marlin factory. So it's a pretty unique beast. Um, I hope you'll come to the museum sometime to see it. And I will leave you with an image of Mr. Ritchie driving his tank in a parade. He, uh, fitted the tracks of the tank with wooden blocks so that when he drove the tank on pavement, it's six and a half ton weight wouldn't destroy the macadam. Um, so quite a special piece to us. Okay, very nice. Thank you very much. Uh, a great example of a very unique item. Uh, one of many in our system. So thank you. Uh, if you have questions for Jen, you can uh, ruminate on them. Uh, put them in the chat or uh, we'll wait until the end after our other four panelists have presented, I will open up to general question and answer. Uh, so feel free to put them in the chat now, or if you'd rather ask uh, in person vocally, uh, we can do that after our, our other presenters have, uh, have had their turn. So again, many thanks, Jen. And uh, I guess, I don't know if it's putting in, in all the, the Jennifers at the beginning, but uh, next in line on, on my screen is Jennifer Royer from Landis Valley Village and Farm Museum. So I will turn it over to our other Jennifer. All right. Here. 
One of Blandes Valley's most unique and rare collection of artifacts comes from the United States Colored Troops of the Civil War. These artifacts are one of the most requested pieces for loan. In fact, in the past few years, they have spent very little time at Landis Valley. Most recently, you could have seen them at the State Museum of Pennsylvania or at the Pamplin Historical Park in Virginia. First, a little history about the United States Colored Troops. In 1862, with fighting underway, the US Congress passed confiscation and militia acts that officially freed slaves from owners who were in rebellion against the federal government and permitted President Lincoln to use them in any capacity with the army. After the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, state and federal officials openly recruited all black regiments to serve under white officials. The Bureau of Colored Troops was created and most of the black regiments were designated United States Colored Troops or USCT. In all, approximately 178,000 African-Americans served in the USCT, representing about one-tenth of total Union forces. Initially, they drew less pay than their white counterparts and mostly served rear guard and supporting roles. Eventually, however, a number did see combat and fought in heavy battles. Pennsylvania established Camp William Penn on July 17, 1862. Camp William Penn, seen on the right here, was the only camp set up exclusively to train USCT troops, drawing recruits from Pennsylvania, Delaware, and New Jersey. It was also the largest training facility of the 18 in the nation during the Civil War. Comprising over 10,000 men, 11 regiments of USCT troops, were trained there, the 3rd, 6th, 8th, 22nd, 24th, 25th, 32nd, 41st, 43rd, and 127th. Tonight, we're most interested in the 32nd Regiment and one soldier named John Warfel. John Warfel served in Company C, 32nd Regiment of the USCT. He was born in Berks County, but in the census of 1850, it records him as living in Chester County by the time he's 11. In 1864, he enlisted at the age of 26. His musket with bayonet and ammunition cartridge box are rare examples of Civil War arms marked with the name and regiment of their USCT owner. Werfel's cartridge box is stenciled J. Werfel, Company C, 32nd R, USCT. Sent initially to Hilton Head Island, the 32nd participated in the siege of Charleston. The Union unit also participated in two attempts to destroy the Charleston and Savannah Railroad. In the second attempt, which was successful, Warfel was wounded in the leg. The 32nd USCT assisted in continued skirmishes against Charleston until the city fell to Union troops in February 1865. Afterward, the unit played guarding roles in that city on Hilton Head and in Beaufort until returning to Philadelphia to muster out of service in August 1865. An observer saw the 32nd USCT return to Philadelphia and wrote, in all the regiments of white troops that I've seen, there have been stragglers and men half or wholly intoxicated. But here, not a man straggled from his place. Not a foot was out of march and not one was intoxicated. In all, the 32nd Regiment lost during service two officers and 35 enlisted men that were mortally, mortally wounded and 113 enlisted men who died by disease. Warfel's British-made Enfield musket is die stamped on top of the musket barrel, John Warfield, Company C, 32 PV. Is also embossed on the stock, BSA, Birmingham Small Arms Trade, and its percussion lock is stamped Tower, 1862. Even though Warfel pieces are well marked, his name appears in three different phonetic, phonetic spellings. W-O-R-F-E-L inside the cartridge box, W-A-R 
F-I-L-D on his musket and W-A-R-F-E-L on his mustard, muster records, which we're gonna see later. We believe that Werfel mustered out. He took the option of purchasing his weapons and accoutrements with costs varying depending on the model from $6 to $16. This collection of unique and rare artifacts is made even more so with Morfell's name on it, also includes a small footstool. The stool is marked on the underside with the name of Morfell's wife, Abigail. We speculate that he might have made this during, while he was in the army, but again, 100% speculation. It's a really good story if he did. We will never know though. Besides his wife, Werfel also had a son named John. After the war, census records show that Werfel worked as a laborer. However, by the turn of the 20th century, he was working in an iron rolling mill. He is interred at Zion African Methodist Episcopal Church in Atglen, Pennsylvania. A GAR marker was placed at his grave and the county provided a tombstone marker. His obituary was, obituary was simple and did not mention the sacrifices he made during the Civil War. It read, Werfel, at his home on Strasburg Road, near Parksburg, John Werfel, age 84 years. Relatives, relatives and friends are invited to attend the funeral from his late residence tomorrow, Saturday, afternoon at two o'clock. Interment at Mount Zion Cemetery at Glen. His personal estate consisted of eight shares of Pennsylvania Railroad stock, appraised at $352, and a framed house and lot of land, appraised at $800. However, the rare and unique collection of artifacts owned and used by Werfel in the 32nd Regiment in USCT, and his story is worth a lot more to us historically and as a teaching tool for many generations to come. Thank you. All right, excellent presentation, very interesting. Again, uh, if you have questions for uh, Jen Royer about the uh, color troops artifacts from the Civil War, uh, you can type them in the chat or uh, we will wait until the other three have presented their objects and then we'll open it up to uh, questions asked orally. So thank you again. Uh, moving on to our next presenter, uh, I guess we'll just, uh, do all the J names at once. Uh, Josh Fox is next on my screen and Josh is uh, the curator at the Pennsylvania Lumber Museum, the site where I work. Uh, so again, having two people with the same name at the same site never gets confusing, but uh, Josh is going to present one of our rare and unique artifacts from the Lumber Museum collection. I will turn it over to you. All right, thank you. Yeah, so let me get my... Screen up, where am I? Here we go. Da, da, da. All right, so I'm going to talk about the Barnhart log loader. This uh, object does pretty much exactly what it says it does. It loads logs. Early on uh, in the lumber industry, Really, manpower was the name of the day. Even when the railroads started to come in, you were still loading the railroad cars by hand, uh, which was very labor intensive. And it took about a crew of 10 men to load a log train. Uh, and these men would do it using either PVs, like you can see in, in the picture here with the, the pointed end or cant hooks, uh, basically the same thing without a point. Josh, and I don't. I hate to interrupt. I don't know if you're using two screens, but uh, we're just seeing the first slide in your slideshow. I don't know if your slideshow is coming up on a different section of your monitor. Uh, no, I'm not. And I see it. <laughs> well, we're. I'm. I'm looking at, and everyone else can correct me if I'm wrong. The uh, the first screen that says Barnhart Log Loader with the color image of the loader. Did that not move? All right. Plan B. Hold on. There it is. I was trying to do it on the... I can see the second screen now with the men hand loading. 
All right, well, I can just go through it this way. So, so they um, load the logs and images. These men are loading their, their logs into the river, but the same idea, you can see how many men it would take to move some of these logs. So there had to be a better way to do it. Let's see if I, it, did it come up now? With yep, looking at Frank Goodyear, yes. So in 1885, Frank Goodyear of Goodyear Lumber, uh, Goodyear Lumber Company, by the way, was probably the largest lumber company operating in North Central Pennsylvania at the time. He approached Henry Barnhart and his newly founded Marion Steam Shovel Company about creating a steam powered log loader. So, steam and shovel, just kind of like if you uh, like me and ever read the, the kids' book, Mike, Mike Mulligan and the Steam Shovel, uh, it look, kind of looks a lot like this Marion Model 28 I have in the, the lower corner. So, the Barnhart log loader that he des designed for Frank Goodyear was very similar. It's the top picture looks pretty much a very similar concept, except instead of a bucket on the loader, the loader at the end of the boom had tongs at the end of the, the length of cable that could be drawn out and lift the logs. So the first four Barnhart log loaders were delivered to Goodyear Lumber in 1886. Did the slide change? Not yet. There it is. <laughs> I now see the Barnhart log loader with three images. Now, all right, so we see the Barnhart log loader with three images. Yes. So the Barnhart was operated by three men. Instead of the 10 man crew, now it took three men to do the log loader. One man to operate the loader itself, and then two tong men who would take out and take the cable to logs, put the tongs into the logs, and were able to guide the logs onto the rails. Now, the log, lo the loader itself could move independently along rails on top of log cars. If you can see in these pictures, the, the Barnhart log loader itself is just the square box with some small wheels that can move along rails that were located on top of the log cars. It had a winch and it could kind of winch itself along, along the, the, um, the rails to go from log car to log car. So you would start at one end and the loader would then kind of be able to move along as it loaded up the, the log cars for the train. Uh, one loader was able to handle about 100,000 feet of lumber a day, and the loader could lift up to 11,000 pounds. So in 1906, Marion introduced the larger Model 12 log loader, and the original log loader became known as the Model 10. And that went too far. <laughs> and so, um, so there were now two types of models, the 10 and the 12. And technology grand.
Uh, so from 1886 to 1927, 218 original log loaders slash the Model 10s were built. And with about half of those appeared to have stayed within New York, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia, with Goodyear Lumber being the largest customer. Only about 20 Model 12s were built from 1906 to 1916. The Model 12s, they were essentially the same thing. They were just uh, had slightly more power and they could lift heavier loads. All right, so. We'll see if this works. This video works. I'm not too confident. Oh, there we go. So here we go. This is actually an American log loader uh, from the Central Pennsylvania Lumber Company, footage from 1927. But this American log loader is very similar in design to the Barnhart log loader. So you can see the operation and how the men would be able to load the logs on there. Um, the American, like I said, very similar. They really tell the difference is the cab on the American tends to be a little more rectangular, a little longer than the more boxy Barnhart log loader. I think uh, we're just having an incredible uh, lag time because uh, your slides and, and video and stuff seem to be quite delayed. So at this point, I'm not sure what everyone else is seeing, but I'm just seeing the static screen with the, the first image of the video there. So, Well, it looks amazing. It does. I I've seen it. <laughs> I've seen it. So this video to to give you some type of context not to interfere with the proceedings of the uh, virtual collection showcase if uh, you know anyone that works for OSHA they would have a heart attack were they to watch uh, these men operating this log loader you have just people spinning around with riding the tongs uh, you know looping the cable back behind logs on the back of a pile and just yanking it and having all the logs fly forward at the operator. Uh, it's quite a sight and it's kind of unfortunate that uh, we're a little, you know, having technical difficulties here and it's not playing. But uh, yeah, it, it, we uh, will make every effort to share that video on the uh, PA Lumber Museum website at uh, a future point. So anything else, Josh? Yes. Can we see the last of the, the Barnhart loaders? Is that up? Not yet. I think for whatever reason, your screen share is just very behind your, there it goes. <laughs> it's, it's like the simulcast delay. <laughs> okay. We're not sure what he's gonna say folks. So we have him on a 30 second delay to make sure that you don't hear any language that- uh... <laughs> It's probably for the best. So, in 1964, the Penn York Lumberman's Club went to Eli Thomas Lumber Company down in West Virginia. They were looking to purchase a Shea locomotive as the centerpiece for a planned lumber museum up in Potter County. Turned out that Eli Thomas still had a Barnhart log loader as well, and the, log, and the Barnhart was purchased for $500. Now, this loader, if you notice the pictures, doesn't have the smokestack. At some point it was converted to a diesel engine. And as such, during that process, it pretty much took off any uh, serial number that might've been on it. So can't exactly date the log loader, but we believe it dates, our log loader dates from about 1903 to 1910, somewhere around that time. Picture on the right is the log loader when it, arrived up in Galton, Pennsylvania, to await the construction of the Lumber Museum. And then restoration occurred for the Barnhart Lower Loader between 1974 and 1997. So it kind of took them a while to get going on that. Uh, from what I read, part of the problem was that there some of the original restoration work 
wasn't done quite right and had to be redone. But we were able to reach out to the Marion Steam um, Company, the original company that built the log loader at the time in the 1970s was still in business. They've since closed, but they were able to provide parts for the log loader. Uh, a boiler and a uh, steam engine was put back in. Um, I'm not, again, not positive where they got that engine from. If it came with the, if it came with it, if Eli Thomas might have still had it around, but it was an original engine because we paid for asbestos removal. So it was definitely an original steam engine and not a fabrication. And you can see some images. The first kind of black and white image is the Barnhart arriving at the museum grounds. And on the other side, you can see the finished um, restoration in 1997 with the Barnhart sitting on one of the museum's log cards. And then as far as we know, our Barnhart log loader is the only one left out of those about 238, 40 Barnhart log loaders that were built. Ours is the only one that we know of, definitely the only restored one. As far as I can tell by internet searches and the like, there's, may, there's a wrecked one somewhere in the woods in, in New York that may or may not still be there, uh, but this is the only Barnhart log loader that we know of that is left in existence. And thanks for listening. And hopefully that sort of worked. That worked well enough. Thank you, Josh. Very, very good. Very interesting. Of course, I'm biased, but uh, yeah, uh, the Barnhart is very unique and one of a kind. Just as an aside, people that uh, like to do model railroading or model making love to visit the Lumber Museum. They come all the time to take pictures of it, take dimensions of it, because, you know, again, it's the only one that we, we know of. And if, if you want one for your model railroad layout, uh, and you need to build it from scratch, it's a, a great way to, to, to be able to do that. So thanks again. Uh, we will move right along to our next presenter, which on my screen is uh, Sue Bates from Drakewell Museum. So I will allow her to talk about her object uh, related to Pennsylvania's oil history. Take it away, Sue. All right, thank you. Well, no one should question the integral role that the oil industry plays in politics and foreign relations. So when did this important role begin? Drakewell Museum has a collection item which tells part of the story. A consular appointment naming Alexander W. Crawford, consul to Antwerp, signed by Abraham Lincoln in 1861. The piece is 18 inches high and 24 inches wide. Dr. Alexander W. Crawford was the son of a Western Pennsylvania pioneer who settled in Allegheny Township, Butler County. Dr. Crawford served two terms as a state representative from Beaver, Butler, and Lawrence counties beginning in 1856. It's possible that the appointment was the decision of Secretary of State William Seward who handled foreign relations for the president. The document reads in part, the President of the United States, to all who shall see these presents, greetings. Know ye that reposing special trust and confidence in the abilities and integrity of A.W. Crawford of Pennsylvania, I have nominated and by and with the advice and consent of the Senate to appoint him Consul of the United States of America at Antwerp. I hereby pray and request His Majesty the King of Belgium, his governors and officers to permit the said A.W. Crawford fully and peaceably to enjoy and exercise the said office without giving or suffering or to be given unto him any molestation or trouble. And then it's signed the 26th day of July, 1861. So not quite two years after the Drake well came in. At the time, coal gas was used to light the streets of Europe, but not in Belgium. 
Only wealthy people could afford to use the rapeseed oil in lamps such as this. The majority of Belgian residents went to bed when the sun went down. A few gallons of kerosene had made their way to Antwerp prior to Crawford's visit, which stirred the curiosity of a merchant who asked Crawford about it. Since Crawford was from the Pennsylvania oil fields, he knew all about petroleum and readily shared his knowledge. Crawford made the business connections and 40 barrels were shipped in August, 1861 to Schmidt and Son who became the Antwerp dealers. By 1863, European sales had risen to 115,000 barrels and in 1864, 230,000 barrels. In 1865, Petroleum was the leading import item in Antwerp, which led to the European markets in which led the European markets in the oil trade. With the outbreak of the Civil War in April 1861, the president might well have had other motivations for seeing the new industry go global. With Crawford's success, it was apparent there was an eager market for kerosene. In 1862, the federal government levied a 10 cent per barrel tax on exports of refined products. In 1864, a dollar barrel tax was levied on crude oil. The union collected nearly $7 million through these taxes by the end of the war. The balance of trade at the beginning of the war was also awry with the union no longer benefiting from cotton exports. Petroleum exports made it possible for the government to purchase war materials and to reduce the export of gold. By 1865, petroleum exports were valued at nearly 16 million, ranking petroleum as sixth among US exports. By 1866, the year that Dr. Crawford left Belgium, the value of your refiner's European sales outstripped domestic sales. Crawford returned to Pennsylvania and became an oil producer himself. The role of oil and gas in the global politics is once again making the news with construction stopping on the pipeline Nord Stream 2 between Germany and Russia. And just think, it all started with the Pennsylvania oil man being appointed ambassador by President Lincoln in 1861. And that's why this artifact is one of the rarest in the Commonwealth's collections. Excellent, Sue, thank you very much. It's very interesting uh, not having uh, spoken with each other before we do this presentation, how much, uh, you know, just as your story resonates with what we're experiencing today, everyone's choices for the objects they've shared have so far had a lot of connections in and of themselves, either with the Civil War or military history or uh, you know, what have you. So thank you, very interesting. Uh, our last presenter tonight is uh, Michael Emery from Cornwall Iron Furnace. And uh, I will turn the presentation over to Mike and let him talk about Cornwall's object. Well, thank you very much, Josh. Uh, just to uh, make sure that, that my presentation is working, is, is my slide showing uh, for the presentation? Yes, I am seeing the slide with the interior and saying Cornwall Iron Furnace and your right. information. So hopefully the gremlins have worked themselves out. So again, my name is Mike Emery. And the object that I have uh, chosen for my presentation this evening is uh, the Cornwall Iron Furnace itself. Uh, by far the largest of the objects that will be presented tonight. And also I hope to, uh, to prove one of the rarest. So this is a map of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania uh, when it was still a colony. This was taken off of the 1770 Nicholas Skull map of Pennsylvania. This was one printed in 1775. And uh, to draw your attention into kind of the lower right quadrant of the map, you'll see a number of red, square, of red uh, stars. And the cartographer that did this map marked out uh, all of the furnaces and forges uh, at that time. And they number uh, 30. 
uh, in this time period. Uh, Cornwall, you can see, is kind of in the upper left, uh, in the center part of the screen. Uh, only one furnace west of the Susquehanna River. Uh, of course, that's something that will change uh, rapidly over time. Uh, by 1840, uh, these 30 furnaces and forges uh, turn into approximately 200 uh, charcoal-fired iron furnaces just throughout the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And of course, regionally, there were also furnaces in places like New Jersey and Maryland and New York, uh, the earliest furnace, Saugus in Massachusetts, and then that would move to different parts of the country. But of course, Pennsylvania was the early uh, powerhouse of, of iron manufacture in the colonies and also the, the new country. Um, but those furnaces uh, would start to come to an end by the latter part of the 19th century. Uh, this is a photo that we have of Cornwall Iron Furnace in 1870. Uh, this is the only photo that we have of the furnace while it was actually in blast. It would go out of blast in 1883. And uh, the photographer came that day, took a photo of this uh, furnace, uh, another furnace that was owned by the Coleman family, which was known as the Cornwall Anthracite Furnace. It burned anthracite coal as opposed to charcoal, and also a photograph of the Iron Master's Mansion. But you can see this is clearly an industrial site. There's very little vegetation and greenery uh, around the furnace itself. Uh, but this photo that was taken in 1900 that was turned into a photo postcard, you can see that the, the works are clearly no longer being used. Uh, all the vegetation and greenery that is growing up, uh, things are looking a little bit forlorn. But this is a time period when antiquarians started going out and looking at a lot of different uh, places like industrial complexes that were going down. This is also, you know, right after the centennial and people are trying to link these sites back to uh, the American Revolution. And this was an area that made uh, cannon and also uh, munitions for the American Revolution. So people started getting interested in a lot of these furnaces by about the turn of the century. And of course, this is what our site looks like today. So not a whole lot changed except for the landscape around it as far as the building is concerned. So this is a building that didn't have to go over and have extensive renovations because it had kind of been kept intact since its closure in 1883. Now that was not the case of all furnaces in Pennsylvania. Uh, this is one of my favorite photos of a charcoal fired iron furnace that was in operation. So this is uh, a furnace that's out near Altoona, Pennsylvania, known as the Springfield Furnace in uh, near the town of Royer in Blair County, also taken about the same time as the photo that I showed of Cornwall. And you can see the workers that are out front uh, in the center of the image, that's the casting house, the furnace stack, which is behind it. This building over here with the pipe coming out of it, that's where the blast apparatus, which is making the air that goes into the furnace to, to raise the temperatures located, charcoal storage behind it, and also the charging house up top. So this is 1875. So when the antiquarians came to take photos of this furnace, this is what it looked like in the 1930s. And this was fairly typical. So all of the, the buildings that were around the furnace stack are completely gone. The stack itself is in this uh, just absolute deplorable shape. Uh, the casting arch in the front has collapsed. You can even see the lining uh, of the inside of the furnace. And to the right is the blast apparatus, uh, what had been a water wheel and a pair of blowing tubs. And today, this is what the same site looks like. Uh, the the you know, trees growing out of the furnace stack, just, you know, it would take a lot of imagination or, or a fairly, uh, you know, someone with a keen understanding to kind of look at this and say, well, this was a, an iron furnace. But unfortunately, this is what's happened to most of the iron furnaces that existed in Pennsylvania and, and even in the rest of North America. So other furnaces had a kinder fate. Uh, this one here, uh, this is an 1876 image of a furnace uh, in Morgantown, uh, Berks County, Pennsylvania, called Joanna Furnace. Uh, the iron works are visible over here to the right. Uh, so when the antiquarians came around in 1931, uh, you know, the buildings aren't intact anymore. You can see a lot of roofs have gone, there are windows missing, but there's still 
uh, the wooden charging house is behind. The stack is very well uh, still there. Uh, parts of the blowing engine are also still intact. But as early as 1946, uh, I believe uh, Jen had made comment of the tank having to be hidden under a stack of hay uh, to get out of, of ending up in the scrap drive. You'll notice that the entire area where the blowing engine is, is completely gone. And that was this huge uh, piece of iron that was being used to reheat air as this was a hot blast furnace in its, in its last iteration. And all of the wooden structures and things that are around this are just completely gone. Uh, now this has a much happier ending uh, than the Springfield uh, furnace in, in Royer. Uh, around 1980, there was a group that was founded uh, and uh, they started having festivals raising money. And since there were a number of great uh, photographs, they did archeology, span they were able to go ahead and bring a great deal of this furnace back. Uh, though largely what you see here are a, a large restoration uh, that was done of this furnace. And there are other uh, furnaces, of course, in the region that are also uh, restorations like Hopewell Iron Furnace, which is a National Historic uh, Site, uh, Curtin Village, which is in the PHMC in Center County. Uh, most of the buildings that are around the furnace stack also are restorations. Uh, so another reason why I think that Cornwall is such a rare survivor is that this existed in a large industrial area. Uh, Cornwall was one of four furnaces operating in Cornwall, Pennsylvania in the 1870s and had an exceedingly large and important uh, iron ore deposit right next to it that operated up until 1973. So the furnace, which I have marked out by this blue arrow, existed within this very large industrial complex. And as the other furnaces stopped being useful, they were all demolished. That today, there's little to anything that survives even of the other furnaces at Cornwall. Because the building survived, so did a great deal of other very rare surviving gear. Uh, this is the blast apparatus. The large wheel on the left when turned allows uh, rods to go up and down inside of these large tubs to the right. And those tubs act with a bicycle pump uh, and compress air that's then forced into uh, the furnace stack itself. All of this is unique uh, equipment. It cannot be seen anywhere else, uh, anywhere. Uh, the same is true of the power source. The original power source is still there. Uh, in the lower right was an engine that was put in in 1859, not one like it, but that very engine. And that would have run 24 hours a day, seven days a week for about nine to 10 months out of the year uh, from 1859 to 1883. Uh, also, the boilers, which are here in the upper left, also still exist, and as do all the steam piping and the water piping that goes in between these, these two pieces. Uh, and of course, the furnace stack, which is so ubiquitous, also then uh, still exists. So I leave on this last slide because I oftentimes have seen people come in knowing that they're going to come and see a furnace, and one of the first things they'll do is walk over to this ore roaster, which has a very similar shape to a stack. And they'll take a picture of it because they think that they're taking a picture of the Cornwall iron furnace. Because if you go to most other furnaces anywhere else, that's all that survived was the stack. So when we tell them that there's this large building and they'll, and they'll kind of look at you and say, no, inside of that building is where the stack is. And it's not until they see what we have here, do they realize what a real furnace looks like, what it was supposed to look like. So this is one of the few places in North America that you can see uh, what a furnace is supposed to look like in the only place where you can see where it actually survived intact. So thank you. Thank you, Mike, excellent job. And yes, Cornwall is indeed a treasure and we are fortunate that uh, our forefathers and mothers in Pennsylvania uh, had the foresight to uh, step in and preserve that site and all the rest of the sites in our system when they did. Uh, excellent example of something very rare and unique in Pennsylvania. Um, so we do have some questions that have come through in the chat and I will ask them in the order received. Uh, we were had a question about the tank. Uh, there appeared to be some fins on the gun barrel of the tank. Uh, Jen, can you 
provide any additional information as to what those might be or what uh, purpose they might have served? Sure. I, um, I think she meant on, on the machine gun itself, there are fins that extend down the length of the barrel. They're made out of aluminum and they function as a cooling agent. Uh, rapid fire machine gun like that got extremely hot and the barrel would overheat and warp if there wasn't some way to cool it. Um, the Marlin was air cooled. Other machine guns of the period uh, had a jacket around them that was filled with water that had to be changed periodically to cool the gun. So that's what those fins are that you're seeing. Very good. Uh, and then there was another question about how Landis Valley acquired the collection from uh, John Warfel. Uh, many, our... many, many years ago, they were donated to Landis Valley. They came in with a large collection of, there was furniture, a lot of pieces, and it was kind of hidden in there. And then wonderful staff members like Mike Emery there um, did a lot of research and found out exactly who John Werfel was and how important he was. That's excellent. Almost by accident then, huh? Okay. Uh, another question uh, relative to the Barnhart log loader. Uh, Josh Fox, do you want to talk about how the boiler of the loader was fired? Uh, and do we know what PSI the boiler operated at? Um, so it was a coal-fired um, boiler, and uh, the one, the loader, the one man was responsible for loading it and, um, you know, operating the loader, and he was his own fireman, unlike a locomotive where you'd have an engineer and a fireman, the one operator of the loader served us both. And then let's see, I actually, <laughs> I actually, I have the specs here. And they're in the wrong vertical direction. <laughs> um, I'm just seeing if I actually have what it says I about think, the bo the boiler. The boiler. I think it was a relatively low PSI, as most of the boilers of that period were. Well, the tongs, the pull at the tongs was at 120 pounds pressure. I don't don't know how that creates the boiler. The boiler was a vertical type uh, with submerged tubes, but I, I don't see a. So the, the steam boiler that we use in the sawmill at the lumber museum, uh, you know, only runs about 150 pounds of pressure. So by today's standards, relatively low pressure, and it's it was a, a, a on the smaller side, uh, the the cab of the loader is decent size, but, you know, not as big as, you know, an industrial sawmill boiler. So it was probably a similar, I'd say right around 150 pounds uh, of pressure per square inch. Uh, we had a question for Mike. What does the ore, ore roaster do? What is the function of the ore roaster? That's, that's a great question. Uh, iron ore in different locations also has other minerals and other things in with it. Uh, so the iron ore at Cornwall had uh, a sulfur content which could affect uh, the quality of the iron. So it was found out pretty early that if you would go ahead and take the iron and roast it uh, just under a fairly low heat, uh, that would drive a fair amount of that sulfur off of the iron. And then that made it much easier that when it was going to go in for the smelting process, uh, not, it, it helped the guys that were loading, so they weren't sucking in as much sulfur as that's coming out and smelting, but also gave a better grade of iron uh, because that sulfur was driven out. Okay, great. Uh, Jen Eaton, are we, are visitors able to get a view inside of the uh, 1917 tank? Yeah, you can see inside it in the gallery, um, the, the, the way that tank operated, it had hinged doors on the front that opened for the driver and the gunner to climb inside. And in the gallery, those doors are open. So you can look right in and see how cramped and tiny uh, it is there. And uh, I know you do some programs throughout the year where you let folks inside of your other tanks and you pieces know. of armor as well, if you want to mention that. Yeah, we do armor tours in the warmer months. Um, I forget, I'm not sure if we're doing one every month. 
um, at least every other month on Saturday. Uh, it's additional admission, but you can tour uh, the other piece, the other vehicles that are out on our grounds and get down inside some of the more modern tanks. It's a pretty uh, intense experience if you've never done it. And while we're on the subject, uh, there was a question about the caliber of the gun on the tank. I'm not sure whether that's the machine gun or the actual uh, uh, shelling gun. Yeah, uh, the M1917 light tank only had one weapon. Um, our particular model tank was fitted with the Marlin machine gun that was a 30 caliber machine gun. Um, there was a variation of, of the M1917 that uh, could be fitted with a 37 millimeter cannon as well. Okay. And then Mike Emery, uh, where did the design of the iron furnace come from? Uh, were they uh, already patterned after furnaces that were already in existence in Europe? Yes. Uh, when Europeans came to Pennsylvania, they already had a fair amount of experience. Uh, in the iron industry. Uh, Great Britain had had a, a long history of iron manufacture and also so they had on the continent as well. So that when people were coming here, uh, they were refining an idea that it already had existed and something that had existed for a while. You know, even if someone kind of from late medieval times would have come to our furnace, they'd look at it and it would look like their furnace on steroids, but everything else would look very similar to what they had. And from Military Museum have shared in the chat that registrations for the armor tours are open online. Go to pamillmuseum.org uh, under the events tab and the armor tours are listed with a registration link if you would like to visit military and see inside of some of their uh, armored equipment. Uh, that was all of the questions in the chat. Anyone else have questions relative to any of the five presentations we just saw? Uh, you are welcome to unmute and ask uh, orally, or if you'd like to put it in the chat, uh, I can ask for you. Again, fabulous presentations. We have so much great stuff in the system here at PHMC, so much intersectionality. I was thinking as you were mentioning charcoal, you know, at the Lumber Museum, we really talk about charcoal as the first major driver of Pennsylvania's lumber industry. Uh, to fire those furnaces and other industrial applications. So all of our history is, is woven together and interconnected in such a neat way. That, and you can, you know, through presentations like this, really drill down and see that and, and get a sense of, uh, you know, what was going on in PA at different points in our history. So, Josh, I, I did just want to add one thing. I know Jen had talked about uh, the John Warfel material. Yes. Uh, I actually went to the farm where that material came from. It was located outside of Parksburg, uh, Pennsylvania, which was another iron producing area. And John Warfel in his later years had worked in, in the iron industry there. And uh, the woman whose property it came from was a woman by the name of Penny Batchelder. And she had worked for the National Park Service for a number of years. Her family had owned that farm since the 1930s. So the thought process was that that was collected very, very locally. And I think one of the things when I helped to do the research on that material that really kind of gave me chills when in the 1850 census, when I saw where John Warfel was living, he was living in a township that was adjacent to where the Christiana resistance happened. So he was a, a free black man living in Chester County after the uh, Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 had been passed. He's in an area where, where uh, you know, slave catchers are coming in and coming after people. And he's living in this household with other free black people uh, that, that he's, you can't see what the relationship is. So it, it was very interesting that when you start to piece all those, those things together and look at when he enlists, you know, this isn't a foreign concept. This isn't something that is very far out from his mind. You know, he's seen what Southern folks were willing to do to put folks like him back in, into bondage. Uh, so I always kind of thought that that was just such a neat thing because, you know, we can't know what his uh, state of mind was, but seeing where he was living at that time and everything, I just thought that that was, that made it so much more poignant uh, of a piece. So uh, I'm not trying to not sell my site, but I, that is a really great collection of autographs. 
that's all right. We're all friends and we're all part of the same system here. And yeah, that's, you know, that's one of those moments where you just get chills thinking about it and, you know, trying to imagine what life was like for someone else, putting yourself right in their shoes and, and trying to gain perspective and have, have their life experience inform how, how we uh, interact and treat each other today. Um, in that vein, and I don't wanna, I know we try and limit this to about an hour. Um, I do have a copy of that Barnhart log loader footage that I could try and show uh, as long as the other panel participants are okay with me doing that. Again, I don't wanna bias anyone toward my own site's uh, uh, <laughs> my own say, site I, presentation. I have it up separately. I can just try that if you want. Well, do you wanna try? If you can't, I, I can maybe. All right. Can we see that? I just see Josh Fox is started sharing screen. I, I see it, but it's really choppy. Do you want me to see if my uh, connection is better? Yeah, I guess you can try. All right. Let me see if I can share. All right. I got to kind of move this around a bit because the uh, play button is behind the uh, controls for the Zoom. <laughs> see if I can get it here. There it goes. All right, can you see that? All right, feel free to narrate, Josh, or would you like me to? <laughs> there you can. I mean, it's just showing the, so that American loader, not the Barnard loader, uh, swinging a log car into position and then loading it up on logs. And the gentleman, as the other Josh mentioned with the OSHA violations, riding <laughs> on top of the logs. And so again, the same, very similar to the Barnard uh, operator in the cab, and then a couple of men working the tongs. Um, and then a, an advantage of a log loader like this is that you can kind of just pull from a mess. You didn't need it to be a nice orderly system if you were trying to load it by um, hand. The tongs could just kind of grab out uh, from the pile and it'll make it work. I think the film is a little bit faster than life, the way it plays back. But even so, just the way logs are flying everywhere, the tongs are going everywhere, you know, they're whipping those log cars from one side of the loader to the other. It, it's just amazing to me that more people weren't injured <laughs> the way that they have this working. But yeah, as, as Josh said, an American log loader, but for all intents and purposes, nearly identical to the way our Barnhart loader would have operated. And uh, this film is from the Central Pennsylvania Lumber Company. So this is in Pennsylvania. Uh, they were one of the largest, if not the largest uh, lumber company in Pennsylvania. Uh, toward the end of the lumber industry boom in the early 20th century from the you know, 19 aughts through like the 20s and 30s and most of their operations were played out by the 1940s. But yeah. All right. Well, you get a sense of that. I will stop sharing here. Yes, indeed, that video would give your safety officer a heart attack. <laughs> we don't have a lot of information about uh, how many men got hurt or died from the log loader. I don't, Josh, you can correct me. I don't remember any specific mention of loader accidents. We have lots of mention of uh, railroad accidents. So runaway trains, brakes that didn't work, you know, collisions, that kind of thing. But I'm not remembering any specific about um, the loader itself, are you? No, not, I don't, not specific to the loader, but even today, 
blogging is the most, or some use the second most dangerous profession in the country. Uh, it's either lumber or commercial fishing, uh, the two most dangerous professions in this country. And I can't imagine it was any safer over a hundred years ago. All right, well, thank you for bearing with us through that technical difficulty. Uh, if there, I'm glad we were able to get that up and share that with you because it's an amazing piece of video that uh, survives from, uh, at this point, almost 100 years ago. So uh, it's, it's one thing to talk about it, it's another to see it in, in actuality. So um, are there any other questions before I open up the uh, voting for your favorite uh, rare, unique, endangered object? All right, well, I will launch the poll. So that is, please choose your favorite rare, unique, endangered object, and that which object presented by our panelists best represents the theme of most rare, unique, endangered object. So we've got the log loader from the Pennsylvania Lumber Museum, the certificate of appointment from the, uh, the Drake Well Museum, the M1917 light tank from Military Museum, the furnace building at Cornwall, and John Warfel's uh, objects from his time during in the Civil War with the U.S. Colored Troops. Uh, just again, you know, it, it, this is all in fun, but it's it's really difficult with a lot of these virtual collection showcases to even pick a winner because you know everything has merit, everything is interesting. Um, it's more or less just just for those uh, bragging rights in and amongst our friends here. And all of our curators and site staff are friends. So uh, please vote. You won't hurt anybody's feelings uh, if you uh, want to choose one object over another just for the purposes of our uh, fun little program here this evening. So I have 43 out of uh, 46 participants that have voted. Any of the other three outstanding like to vote? If not, I will end the poll. 44 now, going once, going twice, and the winner is Pennsylvania Military Museums, M1917 light tank. Congratulations, Jen Eaton. You, Thank you. <laughs> you are the recipient of the PHMC championship belt for virtual collections showcase. You will now get to choose a topic for a future showcase and eventually host that moving forward. Uh, we've got a few other virtual showcases on the books coming up. Uh, you know, you can see by the poll here, very close, very close. Uh, you know, a lot of good stuff here. I'm going to stop sharing the poll. Um, Let's see here in the chat. Uh, Amy shared that uh, our next virtual collection showcase is March the 10th at 7 p.m. Effort of Cloister will be hosting and the theme is mystery objects. So it's a, a real case of, can you guess what this is? And I really hope that while we're doing it, we make everybody wait till the bitter end until we reveal what those objects are. All right, well, uh, I guess that's gonna do it for this episode of PHMC's Virtual Collection Showcase. Thank you all very much for tuning in. Uh, as Amy mentioned in the chat, you can visit our website and look at uh, phmc.pa.gov and look in the calendar of events for upcoming virtual collections showcases and uh, in-person events at all of our sites throughout the system. Uh, I'm uh, incredibly grateful for all of our presenters today Thank you very much for sharing those special pieces of Pennsylvania history with us all. And uh, until next time, everyone be well and uh, uh, get out there and enjoy Pennsylvania's history. Thank you. <laughs>